welcome indeed. A few words of introduction now with respect to our distinguished speaker for this evening's lecture. Rémy Brog is Professor Emeritus of Medieval and Arabic Philosophy at the University of Paris 1, that is the Sorbonne. He teaches also at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, where he has held the Rom Romano Guardini chair. He has been visiting professor at numerous places in Europe and abroad, including not so far away, uh, Boston University and Boston College, Pennsylvania State, for example. He was winner of the Grand Prix de Philosophie uh, de l'Académie Française in 2009 and is a member of the Institut de France uh, in the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences, to be precise. Two years ago, he became a Knight of the Legion of Honor, uh, the National Order of the Legion of Honor. Professor Brog's research concerns ancient Roman and Greek philosophy, medieval Jewish and Arab philosophy, contemporary questions of meaning, and the history of law and culture in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. He is a linguist of uh, very wide and uh, considerable ability and trans a translator of distinction whose own writings have been translated into some 20 different Asian and European languages. He is a prolific author. Among his works is The Law of God, which traces the philosophical history of the idea of divine law in the Abrahamic religions. Most recently, he has published The Reign de l'Homme, which examines the rise and fall of modern man conceived in the modern project as self-legislating. Cardinal Ruini, president of the Ratzinger Foundation's academic committee, which awarded him the 2012 Ratzinger Prize, described Professor Brog as a true philosopher and at the same time a great historian of cultural thought who unites a profound and unequivocal Christian and Catholic faith to his speculative ability and historical vision. And so he is, and so he does. We were privileged to have Professor Brog as our Burt's lecturer in 2012, and we're very happy indeed to welcome him back today. He will speak to us under the rubric, Three Foundations for Law. Professor Brog. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words, for your kind uh, invitation. But well, as you have you just been telling us, this is not the first time that the honor of speaking at McGill uh, has been bestowed upon me. Last time I was introduced by uh, Professor Ellen Aitken. And let me uh, dedicate this present lecture to her memory and, well, I'm confident to her to cool. And I'll begin uh, this lecture with setting up a very simple schema, not to say a simplistic one. But I think this schema could help us understand our present situation, perhaps our present predicament, in front of the problem the foundation of law. For I contend, this is my first thesis, that we have to do with three models for the foundation of law rather than with two, as it is more often than not silently assumed. Those two models are natural law and lego positivism. The conflict between the two views was settled long ago already by the victory of legal positivism, which explains why natural law is almost ever mentioned only pro memoria. And well, I contend that we have to make the plot more complicated by adding a third candidate namely the idea of a divine law. Each of these three concepts corresponds more or less strictly to a period of history 
at least we accept to divide history into three periods, i.e. ancient times, middle ages and modern times. A division that, albeit contestable, has become commodious because of its being so commonly received. The conception according to which law represents a natural fact is well attested in classical antiquity with different shades, as this is the case, for instance, in Aristotle and in Stoic philosophy. The concept of the divine law can be found in the ancient world against, again, <clears throat> almost everywhere and with different colors. But it takes a turn fraught with serious consequences with the religions that claim to have been revealed. This happened, first of all, in the representation dear to the religion of ancient Israel of commandments given by God to human beings. But it comes to, the, to a head and gains its, 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 oh, sorry, its utmost clarity in the Middle Ages with the Islamic concept of the Sharia. Therefore, I will take it as King's evidence in this presentation that proceeds almost only by ideal types. Lincoln positivism has foretasters in the ancient world too, in the conventionalism of sophists or of Epicureans. But it had to wait till modern times for it to present itself as a fully articulated doctrine. So we have the other ancient world, other Middle Ages, rather uh, uh, modern times, each time as an emphasis rather than as an exclusive property of those periods of time. But then I will introduce three criteria which will enable me to formulate what those three systems have in common as well as what distinguishes the one from the other, namely the content of the rulings, the reference to the divine, and the positive character of norms. Let me present them by completing my table. I put that content on the rulings. Here I will venture the word theocracy. I'll tell you a bit more about it. And here, positivity. Well, I will comment upon this pattern by underlining first what those systems have in common, two by two, and then I'll underline what separates them. First, the common features. Natural law and legal positivism have in common the content of the ruins. To be sure, this holds good only approximately. Legal rulings that have to be founded correspond to the conditions of a peaceful common life that obtain for all human beings. Thus, we find, for instance, in the Decalogue, something like the rock-bottom survival kit of human societies, what C.S. Lewis called the Tao, a set of rules which according to him was to be found everywhere. So that Christianity, which he stood for as its apologist, had no privilege at all in this point. This distinguishes natural law and legal positivism on the one side and divine laws on the other hand. In the Pentateuch, in the Torah, there are not only the Ten Commandments, Far from that, the Torah contains two socio-political rules, the so-called mishpatim, which hold good for a definite polity, living in certain conditions. 
It contains too what the Hebrew calls Hokim, which Latin scholasticism called Praecetta Ceremonialia, the reason of Celtic uh, rulings, if you prefer, the reasons of which are hidden to human gaze. Classical examples of such commandments are interdictions to perform certain mixtures, such as sowing in the same field seeds of different kinds of cereals, or weaving in the same fabric fibers of vegetal and animal origin, say cotton and wool. Jewish thinkers endeavored to find for the Hukim plausible reasons and put forward various answers. Among them, Maimonides deserves pride of place, for the great thinker almost had to invent as an explanation a primitive religion, the cultural practices of which had to be staved off by the commandments. In the Islamic Sharia, one finds commandments, the reasons of which are not self-evident, but they are far less numerous and easier to justify than in Judaism. As an example, let's mention something quite trivial, uh, the prophet's advice of letting one's beard grow and trimming one's moustache. So, have in common the idea of the sovereignty of the divine, i.e. the idea of a theocracy. By this word, so apt to conjure up hatred or disgust, I clearly do not mean what under this name haunts the nightmares of many people, i.e. the dictatorship of men of religion. Here I take the word in its etymological meaning, i.e. power belongs to God. Let me remind you here that the word was in a word didn't possess originally any derogatory flavor, and even that it was coined, quite in the contrary, as a term of praise by Josephus, the Jewish historian, who was eager to extol the Jewish polity that, insofar as it was ruled by the law of Moses, did not fit into one of the different kinds of government distinguished by classical political philosophers. It was neither monarchic nor democratic, let alone aristocratic, but precisely theocratic. Now, I contend that in both cases, natural law as well as divine law, well, I've done something wrong here. Hmm? Uh, sorry, I, I simply skipped stupidly. A whole paragraph. <laughs> Let me get back to the contrast <coughs> between the common nature between legal positivism and divine law. I'm absolutely sorry, I beg your pardon. Legal positivism and divine law have in common the idea of a positivity of norms, to wit, that these norms are not discovered somewhere inside of this given, but as the word has it, a word which comes from the Latin ponere. They are set. When, when Kant deduced those rulings from any consideration of what is, even if one scans being in its deepest layers, norms are made. As a consequence, they had a beginning in time, not only as for their being enforced, but as for their very existence. Their publication by promulgation that automatically brings about their validity is the absolute beginning of their existence. This is what distinguishes Lego positivism as well as the divine law from natural law. Well, I come back to uh, what I uh, uh, jumped to, to uh, uh, quickly. Then we have a theocracy that is the common feature uniting divine law and natural law. I'll explain why. For I contend, and I come back to uh, the point uh, in which I was stuck, I contend in both cases, uh, natural law and divine law, 
The ultimate instance that decides about norms possesses, be this overly, overtly acknowledged or discreetly intimated, divine characters. This relationship with the divine distinguishes both natural law and divine law from legal positivism. By this token, we get three couples of strange bedfellows. Yet don't be arrested. In order that those beds should not harbor some indecent couplings, I will separate <laughs> them presently by underlining the distinctive features. Don't fidget, please. First, natural law and legal positivism part company from each other in the most evident way by the origin of the norms. Legal positivism rejects every attempt at grounding the normative on the factual. It thereby prolongs the critique which David Hume leveled against the sophism which he was the first to see through and won against. From being, you can't deduce any duty whatsoever. From the is, you can't deduce any ought, or to put it in Kant's terms, from the sign, you can't deduce any solemn. It has its place as well in the wake of, uh, I mean, legal positivism has its place as well in the wake of the, refu of the refutation by George Edward Moore of what we have been calling the naturalistic fallacy ever since. With Moore, the disjunction of the is and the ought already performed by Hume in one direction kind of receives its complement in the other direction, i.e. from the ought you can't possibly deduce it is at the same distinction, but not in the same direction. The man who set out to sketch a consequent theory of legal positivism might have been the German legal scholar and philosopher Hans Kelsen. According to him, the concept of a fundamental norm, Grundnorm, has nothing to do with the supreme principle of behavior that would depend on a fact. Very much on the contrary, such a fundamental norm represents the apotheosis of positivity. Since the highest point that we can reach, that we can reach at, and to which we can sort of fasten the norms, is positive in nature. Precisely because it constitutes a norm and not a fact. Such a fundamental norm is what he calls, not without a play on the words which echo each other, a hypothetical ground, hypothetische Grundlage, since this ground is not posed, but presupposed, nicht gesetzt, sondern vorausgesetzt. This resembles very much the way in which Aristotle called the supreme principle of non-contradiction an opinion or an assumption, doxa in Greek. In an analogous way to Plato observed that among the most beautiful laws we have to place under the most beautiful ones the law according to which it is not allowed to young people to argue on the value or lack of it of laws. On the contrary, all are ordered to praise them unanimously. The most beautiful of all laws is that we should abide by the laws. This law is kind of the law of laws. But no particular law explicitly stipulates that it has to be obeyed. Each and every law takes for granted this duty of obedience. Legal positivism. Legal positivism and divine law are distinguished by the nature of the instance that sets them. The power that enforces them is not the same. Far from that, they differ toto cello, a phrase that should in this case be taken most literally, since divine law claims to have its origin in the might of heavens, 
whereas legal positivism remains utterly earthly, this worldly, secular. For Islam, and I said that Islam is the, but will give King's evidence for the concept of the divine law, or the, the, the ideas there under its full fledged form. The only legitimate lawgiver, the only one who can classify human actions in the five categories, i.e., compulsory, laudable but not compulsory, neutral, blameworthy but not forbidden, and strictly forbidden. We have five categories. The only instance that is allowed to classify human actions under those five headings is God, and God alone. Such is, for instance, the teaching of Al-Ghazali at the end of the 11th century. And a far later author, who habitually is considered as a modernist and a reformer, Mohammed Abdul, an Egyptian of the late 19th century and early 20th, tells us the reason why this is so. Quote, human intellect, when left to itself, is unable to furnish its possessor that in which consists his happiness in this life. As a consequence, as a consequence of this basic human impotence, man needs God's help. If this is so, decisions which emanate from human powers, like parliaments or judges, should be either rejected whenever they run counter to divine commandments, or accepted in a merely pragmatic way when they decide on questions that had not been settled by the divine law. As a rule, one avoids to designate such rulings in the same vocabulary as the one which one utilizes for divine law. One prefers to utilize terms that suggest the idea of circumstantial rulings provisional in nature, like arrangements, danzimat, and so on. This stems ultimately from the very nature of the Islamic God. He is a God of historical revelation. To be sure, he doesn't reveal anything about his own personality. But he, personality with quotation marks, but he makes known his will inside history in the holy book and through Muhammad's statements, silent approvals and conduct. God selected this man in view of his future mission and he purified him in advance. This is the meaning of the Arabic Mustafa, which became a first name, so that he might serve as an example for human behavior. The Prophet is the beautiful example, as the Quran has it. His sayings and doings, his statements, be they explicit or implicit, are in practical a far more important source of law than the Quran, because the latter decides only on some points of penal law, of family law, and inheritance law, and that's it. The law that is built on these bases, i.e. Mean not only the Quran, but the traditions about the Prophet, uh, the law that is built on these bases obtains as a Sharia. It is here opposite that we should make a distinction. The Islamic Sharia doesn't exist and never existed as a construction, as a unified legal system. There is, to the contrary, a coexistence of several legal schools for, for Sunni Islam. And there's Shiism apart from that. All of those schools set out to deduce from the revealed sources of law rules that can be applied to the problems of everyday life, which opens the way to some flexibility. And one frequently takes this fact, this diversity of rulings, and of legal schools, as a stepping stone in order to further the, com the compatibility of Islamic law with what is done in the Western world. All this may be true. Yet, in any case, a principle remains above any possible contestation. Beyond the plurality of the sharias, of the shari, 
and as the common background, there is the overall idea of a legislation divine in origin, what we could call a shara. God's revelation is the disclosing of his will, and his will crystallizes in the form of a legal system. Natural law and divine law distinguish themselves from each other by the representation of the divine which is involved in each of them. Both contain in them an element of divinity. You remember that I made this claim uh, right at the beginning. This holds good, too, for the concept of nature on which natural law rests. Let me here sketch to what extent this is the case. First, some words on the concept of nature, which is presupposed when natural law is at stake. Such a nature has almost nothing to do with what spontaneously floats in our minds of late commerce when we hear the word nature. This may be the origin of the difficulty which may be insuperable that we stumble upon when we try to make the idea of a natural law understandable, not to say palatable, to our contemporaries. The nature of natural right, natural law, sorry, is not what we have known since Galileo's intellectual revolution as being the object of what we call natural sciences. Philosophers and physicists who brought about this revolution and reflected upon it identify nature with lifeless matter. Some even insist on removing from it any trace of spontaneity. This happens, for instance, with a perfect clarity with the English chemist Robert Boyle, who in the same year as Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica devoted a whole treatise to exercise this bogey of a spontaneous nature. For him, nature is lifeless matter. This nature, the nature of natural law, is not the raw state of the human species, such as it is depicted by the Epicurean teaching on the origin of society, the so-called state of nature, such as we know it, as we know the Epicurean doctrine, through Lucretius' didactic poem, or through its later, early modern revival in the work of Thomas Hobbes, Individu i.e. individuals perhaps born by spontaneous generation out of the moisture of the earth, roaming in the primeval forests and of getting together, making contracts of sorts. Thirdly, this nature of natural law is still less the monster that never stops swallowing and ruminating its own children, this ewig verschlingende, ewig wiederkäuende Ungeheuer that we have been imagining since Goethe, this was a quotation from the Werther, or, from, or since Schopenhauer, are either force, blind and perhaps even cruel, that doesn't call into being if not for it ever again to destroy its creatures. In a nutshell, to good any houseman, whatever brute or blackguard made the world. The concept of nature that natural law brings to bear corresponds rather to the worldview of the Stoics. And for the history of ideas, it originates in it. Now, this nature is fraught with divinity, pervaded with it, unless it simply is identical with God. It is, or rather, she is, this nature is almost a person, a Deus siwe natura to quote Spinoza's famous formula. This nature, the natural law, presents itself under two guises. It is first the beautiful order, the cosmos of the universe in its articulated whole, an order that invites to conclude to the existence of a benevolent providence that has to be imitated by our good deeds. 
The second of the ways in which a divine holds us under its sway is still more decisive. It does that first as the instinct of socialization in man as well as in some animals. That's the historic oikeiosis. It does the same too by the presence in the souls of the living beings that are endowed with reason of a spark of the original divine fire. And this is moral conscience. It is not indifferent or meaningless that according to the classical conception of conscience, the latter is spoken of as being God's voice, walk stay. And we have to take this expression quite literally. And this holds good as well for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose famous outburst should perhaps be taken quite seriously. Conscience, sorry, conscience, divine instinct, immortal and heavenly voice. Conscience, instinct, divine, immortal, et celeste, what? All of us have learned that at school. Well, what is the point in referring to nature? In the contemporary epoch, natural law is at the same time solemnly excluded and secretly reintroduced. As I said at the beginning of this talk, natural law has not a very good kudos in our time and age, especially in academic circles. For nature, is understood as a fact, void of meaning and value. What we call at present, with a demeaning tone, the biological. As for conscience, in the second way for nature to be present, present in natural law, as for conscience, one sees in it hardly more than a psychological phenomenon, lacking every constraining force unless, which happens pretty frequently, one simply debunks it as the mere interiorized result of social pressure, when one doesn't explain it away by seeing in it a biological phenomenon, the mere result of natural selection. Nevertheless, one sometimes tries to get shelter under natural law when we have to set a limit to an extreme legal positivism. This happened, for instance, at the Nuremberg trials, where the convicted Nazis argued that they had done scarcely more than obeying the laws of their country, and that these laws were issued by authorities that had legitimately got the power. It was objected that they could and should have listened to the voice of their conscience. This attempt remained short-lived, however, and when quickly thrusted natural law back into its sheath. Another cop-out that has become particularly popular in our time and age consists in camouflaging natural law under ersatz names like human rights or human dignity. Such is the way in which legal positivism carried the day in its conflict with natural right, at least officially. Now, what if we had to fight another battle? A war that would have its battlefield inside positivity, between a setting of the norms by merely human instances on the one hand, and a setting of those norms by a divine authority. If the choice of an instance that could legislate in the last resort and without appeal should be between God and men, one may ask whether the latter, i.e. human beings, will long be a match against the tremendous an opponent. Religions agree, and this is most understandable from their very definition, in giving preference to the creator over the creatures. 
The New Testament says that very clearly. We ought to obey God rather than men, says Peter in Acts 5. As for Islam, it accepts as a fundamental principle the hadith, alleged utterance of the Prophet, quoted by Ibn Hanbal as an answer to the Caliph al Mahmud at the time of the so called Mutazilite crisis, 9th century. I quote, there is no obedience towards a creature at the price of a disobedience towards the creator. La taqata li mahluk li ma'asiyatil khaliq. Those formulas coincide, I mean Peter's formula and even Hanbar's formula, coincide as for the content. Even if the two religions don't have the same idea of what makes the divine origin of an injunction. For Christianity, it is what God keeps dictating to conscience. For Islam, it is what God once dictated to his prophet. Be that as it may, referring to man, to his or her humanity, to what makes him or her human, and so on and so forth, doesn't cost that much. But it doesn't give us much mileage either. For in the present time, the question is becoming hot whether the human species will remain able to stand for its own legitimacy for a long time. Human rights, human dignity, the idols in front of which we strew so much incense, float somewhere in the clouds as long as one does not explain why what is human should be considered as worthy to go on existing. In order to give the value of the human a fundament, one needs a prop that has to be found outside of the realm of the human. This Archimedean point is, if I may speak the language of Aquinas, quod omnes dominant deo, what everybody calls God. In the long run, the human won't be able to rely on anything else than something divine. But what kind of divine? The choice is up to us. Well, you may have observed that uh, this paragraph is a summary of sorts of the uh, two lectures that I was bestowed the honor of giving here uh, well, now three years ago. Let me remind you here that invoking the natural may function as a bulwark against every kind of positivity. And in particular, not only as this happens for the most part to damn what can be arbitrary in human law-giving, but as decidedly against the claims of a divine law. In other words, not only against relativism in the realm of norms, a scare crowd for many, but as well, and perhaps in a more important way, against a theological absolutism. The concept of divinity that undergirds natural law includes nature as the whole of created beings, and together with it, the nature of man as a living being endowed with reason, anima al rationale. Because of that, Western legal systems could combine with one another the different possibilities to furnish law with a foundation and put them in an order in diverse proportions, such as what happens, for instance, in Aquinas' treatise on the laws in the Summa. On the other hand, the representation of the divine, which is presupposed by the divine <coughs> law, excludes the concept of nature. Islam, which developed the most perfect form of divine legislation, doesn't know the concept of a natural law and can't possibly know it. To be sure, it may happen that one should look for an approximation to the concept of nature around the Islamic idea of an innate disposition 
towards God, the so-called fitra. Yet, this crazy, crazy natural element has rather the function of subverting what we would designate by the word nature. For man is supposed to be spontaneously a Muslim. The reason being that Islam is defined as the innate religion, Deen al-Fitra, of man. This was recently retold by the Declaration of the Human Rights in Islam that was proclaimed in Cairo in 1990 in order to deduce from this principle the interdiction of inducing a Muslim to leave Islam and change religions. According to a well-known hadith, every man is born according to this disposition. And the parents make the child a Christian, a Jew, or a Zoroastrian. The child is in no need to be made a Muslim. Is that anyway? For the Quran knows a prologue in heavens, namely the scene in which we are told that the whole of Adam's offspring, miraculously drawn from his loins in an instant and strewn in front of Allah's throne, unanimously acknowledges his lordship. <laughs> this is the reason why Islam has no sacrament of initiation such as baptism, because it has no need for it. In order to enter the nation, the Ummah, the confession of faith, the Shahada, is enough. For such a confession does hardly more than ratifying the pre-eternal acknowledgement of Allah's Lordship. Told in the verse that I was <coughs> quoting or alluding to. Bali spoken what could say with a smile, that Islam knows some sort of confirmation, but no baptism. The latter is useless, because such a baptism has been there from the outset, before history set in. As an example for a practical consequence of this state of affairs, a foundling is considered as Muslim and raised as such as long as his or her parents, if they happen to belong to another confession, don't turn up and claim the child as their own. Another consequence, a more important one, is the potential universality, the constraining force of the Sharia, which claims a sovereignty that extends to the totality of mankind. This distinguishes, by the way, the Islamic Sharia from the Jewish halakha, the Jewish law, which holds good only for Jews. The Gentiles, the goyim, or the nations of the world, ummot ha'alam, are only bound to obey the seven elementary precepts given to Noah when he left the arch. It is even explicitly said that the goal of Moses' law is none other than building a wall of sorts that would isolate the chosen people from the rest of the nations. The idea occurs in Alexandrian Judaism even before the so-called retreat behind the fence of the Torah after the destruction of the Second Temple. On the contrary, the Prophet of Islam was sent to every human being, according to the Quran, or to quote a famous hadith, to the red as well as to the black. Hence, Islamic Sharia should obtain in principle for every human being as such. As a conclusion, our Western legal systems take their bearings from the idea that one can get back in human beings to an elementary rock bottom level which predates the acceptance of this, of that, access to the divine. The fact of being human would thus lie deeper than the division of human species in diverse religions. Now, this is far from being self-evident. In order that the human as such might possess a value, it is necessary not that man should receive, receive from God commandments to fulfill, but that God should first of all 
emit on the essence and the existence of man a positive judgment. It might be the case that we should be compelled to ground this primacy of the human and in its wake our whole Western legal system on a definite theology of creation. Thank you for your